So incredibly excited and happy to be reunited and joined by my good friend, mentor, and crash reconstruction expert, Russ Boynton. Russ, go ahead and take a moment to introduce yourself and tell everyone about your extremely accomplished background. Yeah, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Noreen and Skydio, for having me. Um, and it's great to work with you again, uh, too, Noreen. Um, uh, my background is uh, former law enforcement, retired from New Hampshire, and uh, uh, former Marine, uh, spent some time in Afghanistan. I'm a, a crash reconstruction expert. Uh, and uh, I testified as an expert in courts in most of the New England states. Um, currently uh, with you from uh, from the Denver, Colorado area. Um, uh, so looking forward to today. And uh, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Awesome, thanks Russ. I'm very humble too. I feel like you missed out a lot of very important pieces. <laughs> Um, yeah. My name is Maureen Tarleton, and I lead strategy and marketing for public safety here at Skydio. But most importantly, I spent more than a decade as a crime scene analyst with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, as well as several years with Faro Technologies, dedicated to crash and crime scene documentation, reconstruction, and forensic analysis. So this topic has been my life for many years now, and I'm coming to you from just outside Cleveland, Ohio. So to any of my Ohio friends logged on, you can reach out to me at any time. Whether you are using traditional methods for scene measurements, anything from hand measurements to total stations, or you are using 3D laser scanners, drone data capture can be integrated into your current workflows or replace some of those existing methods. Many agencies have completed studies on the use of drones for speeding up their time of measurement on scene. And on average, they're finding that drones are 75% faster than some other methods. Additionally, from a crash perspective, the Federal Highway Administration uh, states that every single minute that an accident continues to be a hazard, it increases the uh, chance of additional accidents by almost 3%. And for all of us that have worked those scenes, I don't know that I can remember any fatal accident that I was out on that a car didn't decide it just needed to drive through the tape and the cones and that's the way that it needed to go home. Clearing roadways fast is imperative. Of course, drones aren't ideal for all situations. They aren't the best choice for mapping evidence on the interior of a residence, but they are an excellent tool for all outdoor scenes from shooting incident that covers a long stretch of roadway to a use of force or to a major accident or fatal crash, which is what we are focusing on today. What's most important other than using drones just for image capture is understanding what you can do with those images and how you can take those individual images captured by the drone and create compelling courtroom presentations to assist you in telling the story in court to the triers of truth. Drones don't just provide additional photographs. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people that are like, great, it's another camera, it just flies in the air. Those photographs can provide you a lot of additional information that you can use in forensic software for deliverables. Um, first of all, listed on this slide here, uh, those images can be combined into one single image in orthomosaic. And that can be used as the foundation for your line diagrams, which we all know is the most commonly used and always requested at courtroom deliverable. I'm convinced that no matter how advanced we get with technology in this field, we will always be required to have that bird's eye line diagram for court. That ortho mosaic image can be imported into diagramming software like Ferrozone, and it basically serves as an updated at the time of your incident satellite image. So instead of having to import a Google or a Bing satellite image to assist with your diagram, which isn't an accurate representation of your scene at the time, you can import an ortho from a drone. Next, especially for all of those of you who are familiar with the 3D world, those exact same images can be used in the photogrammetry engine to create a point cloud similar to what you are capturing with any type of LiDAR or 3D laser scanning. Once you have that 3D model via the photogrammetry, now we can provide perspectives and, otherwise, and views that are otherwise difficult to understand with just standard photography and certainly difficult to understand with these 2D line drawings. 
Having been in the 3D space now for several years, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of 3D data in the courtroom. Testimony has gone from 2D images and like horribly painful descriptions of where you're located in a particular image in a scene to giving a jury a full understanding spatially of the environment as you were there at that time. And the best part of it all is that these images and these 3D point clouds can be used in forensic software, specifically Ferrozone 3D Expert, so that you can create your deliverables and all of your forensic analysis all in one place. You no longer have to move from the drone to one piece of software to another piece of software and finally to your diagram. You can do it in one place. <clears throat> My slide, there we go. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about that is a feature kind of of Skydio drones is our map capture. We've already spoken to 2D diagrams and how important they are for you. And again, this is taking all of those individual images captured by a drone and making them into one single image in ortho mosaic. With our latest Skydio X10 vehicle, once you have completed a map capture, you can export that image, that ortho mosaic image out as a TIFF. And again, that can be imported directly into the diagramming software. So on board my drone, I can create my TIFF. I can export that out and bring that right into Ferrozone and start my lane diagram. And that's kind of what you're seeing here to the right. So on the top, just the ortho mosaic image. And on the bottom, you can see that I just pulled out some quick dimensions, added some white lines there for my curves. And in Ferrozone, I could just turn that image off and have my line diagram and be done for my diagram for court. Here's another example of 2D map capture, and Russ will speak more specifically to this case here in a little bit. But again, at the top, you're seeing the ortho mosaic image. So again, that's all of those images stitched together from the drone. And then he just traced over it in Ferrozone to get a 2D line diagram. And that's what you're seeing on the bottom. So he just turned off the image and presented just the line diagram. So another example um, of something that you can do with a Skydio drone is a software that we call 3D Scan. And in a second here, I'm going to play a video that shows you the process of capturing that information. Um, what you're seeing here is on the drone setting up a 3D scan. So right now it's looking at its environment. Once it's done, you're going to set some pillars and some volume. I'm going to set this up a little bit just in the interest of time. So we're setting up our pillars around the uh, vehicles here. And you'll see that we're going to set some volume, so a ceiling and a floor. Once you've done that, you can set some other uh, settings there on the drone. And the drone just goes off and does its thing. So you can see that it's capturing, now it says 697 photos. Once you've set that volume, once you've set those pillars, it knows what it needs to do and it just goes off and, and does it. So you don't have to worry about controlling it. You don't have to do anything manually. It's taking all the images that you need with the intention of making a 3D point code at the end. Capturing all of the side lap and overlap in different angles you need with the intent of creating that 3D point club. See here in the video, it's almost done, close to that. Um, and then it just ends there and you can create the onboard model, which is what it's doing, processing that scan. And it will create an onboard model and then of course export that map capture for you as well. We're gonna talk specifically about what an onboard model is and what that looks like. So specific to 3D scan on our X10, you can now generate a model of your scene right on the drone um, before you clear. And so the idea is that this ensures on-site confidence that you've captured absolutely everything that you need before clearing the scene. That model will export as a .gltf. And I've worked very closely with the zone team in the last couple of weeks. You can now import those directly into zone as a 3D model as well. I would say for 3D models in, in crash and crime, we're not probably not going to be using a mesh model a whole lot for reconstruction, but they are a great tool for anything demonstrative. What you're seeing on the right side of the screen here is from a demonstration that we did. This was a 3D scan of this patrol vehicle. So again, we set the drone down. Um, we set up our pillars around the vehicle. We set our ceiling and our floor. 
the drone went off and it did its thing. It came back and then on board the drone, we were able to create this model. Um, and so this can be helpful for, you know, I had a lot of people ask me, like, why, why would we use this mesh model of a patrol vehicle? But as you know, in diagramming and oftentimes in anything that's use of force, officer involved type incident, um, they want your diagrams to be pretty accurate to the scene. And so being able to take these vehicles now, I could do some cleanup and get rid of the ground. I can import that exact model of a patrol vehicle to position them correctly in a diagram to have the correct deliverables in a 3D environment to make sure we have the right perspectives. This is a really quick fly through. Um, there's not a whole lot to see here except for the point cloud that was created, but I wanted to give you an idea of what a point cloud looks like created from the drone images. This particular capture was 212 images and it took 12 minutes to capture that data. Again, that's not 12 minutes of you controlling the drone. That's just 12 minutes of it going off and doing its thing and then coming back and landing when it's complete. Uh, distance to surface on this was 10 feet. Our ground sampling distance was 0 0.05 inches. You can see the overlap and side lap were 80 and 70%. I took those 212 images. I imported them into Pharaoh Zone's photo points photogrammetry feature. I set that at medium quality, and for the 212 images, it took about 33 minutes to process on my computer. Once it was done, I was able to import that directly back into the software and create this quick fly-through video that I'll go ahead and play here for you again. I will say in this particular instance, I just let the photogrammetry engine, photo points, uh, scale the point cloud via the GPS coordinates captured by the drone. However, we could always make that more accurate if we're using ground control points or if you have RTK um, or if you have known measurements within multiple images. Um, here's a quick image because I get asked about this quite a bit is accuracy. Um, this is from a more recent 3D scan. And again, I took all of those images, I brought them into Pharaoh Zone and I created a 3D point cloud from them. <laughs> So I thought, you know, what's a quick way to kind of check my measurements on this scene? So I pulled a wheelbase measurement from um, the beloved Ford Crown Victoria Police Interceptor, which you'll see that I got a 9.50 feet for my wheelbase. I then went into Faro Zone's uh, vehicle specs database and I looked up that exact same vehicle, which was giving me a 9.51. Um, and so you'll see that's a difference of about one point or 0 0.12 inches, sorry. So it's also important to note that again, this point cloud was just generated from GPS coordinates. I did not have a known measurement. I did not have ground control points. This was just from the 3D scan, importing those images and doing it based on uh, the GPS coordinates. Using that same data, so the, the big question here is great, I have this drone data, like what do I do with it now? Using that same data, I um, just dropped in some models from Faro Zone and very quickly within minutes was able to generate a 2D diagram of that scene. So from the image prior, you saw the police interceptor, you saw some evidence placards there. I was able to drop those in real quickly, added a body in another vehicle, a couple uh, identifiers on there and some measurements. And literally in less than 10 minutes, I had a 2D diagram that I could potentially attach to a case log. File. So the key here is 2D image for your ortho mosaic and the 3D point cloud for creating diagrams as well as creating this perspective because you now have elevation. So now Russ, I'll throw it off to you so you can talk through your case study. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have some background before we go into the fly throughs? Yeah, and first I wanted to address your uh, the mesh the mesh model um, topic. Um, I have um, I have used a mesh models uh, printed on a 3D printer from scan data in the past, um, and uh, I think there's no more powerful delivery or deliverable for the courtroom is to hand those models off to the jury and say these are how the the vehicles came together. So you know fit that out and and see for yourself. Um, I didn't prepare uh, uh, some exhibits of those for this for this uh, demonstration, but I just wanted to let you know that that's a very powerful tool, and I think it's uh, 
it's a more and more commonplace in the courts these days that they are, in fact, 3D printing um, these scans, uh, which are converted to 3D uh, textured meshes and then using them in the courtroom. Um, the, the, uh, the case study that I'm presenting for you today was actually a, a double fatality. It happened a few years ago. Uh, I'm from New Hampshire, so this is a New Hampshire case. Um, this was a uh, pickup truck uh, driving uh, down a hill. Um, the operator was uh, traveling uh, above this ex uh, posted speed limit, lost control, um, uh, DUI as well, um, went off onto the shoulder, came back onto the road uh, roadway and uh, into a yaw. And while, into, while in a yaw, you know, rotating uh, or yawing across the center line of the roadway, uh, struck an oncoming uh, Nissan uh, vehicle that was going in the opposite direction. Uh, and those occupants uh, were killed in, in that vehicle. Um, the background about the data set is the police uh, in this case do, uh, do have and, and were using a Faro, uh, an older uh, scanner, a Faro Focus S laser scanner um, with a 350 meter range um, on that scanner. They took a total of 14 scans and this was just about at, um, at um, just as the uh, daylight was, uh, sun was setting on the horizon, so things were beginning to get dark. They started with uh, full color and then changed from color scan to grayscale scan toward the end. Um, I've presented, I, I've created some deliverables here, one uh, in, in daylight and the other one with basically lights out, if you will, or lower lighting conditions, just to demonstrate the power of the lighting uh, features in the Ferro Zone 3D Expert software. Um, so the first, uh, the first set you will see is just the police data. This was uh, data given to me by the, uh, the investigating agency, uh, nothing more than um, uh, showing that point cloud as created in Faro Scene software. Um, <clears throat> again, as I said, it's 14 scans. You can see that I've cropped the, uh, the lower portion of that point cloud, um, the data from, from that point to the uh, bottom part of your screen was very sparse. And I didn't uh, think it was uh, really worth having as part of the, the overall point cloud. It looks a little cloudy on my end, but <clears throat> so this is just a, uh, what, we, what we call a fly through video was created from the Ferro scene software, where we're looking at the, uh, the two vehicles at final rest position in the roadway. Of course, this is after the occupants have been removed. Um, there is quite a quite a hill there. Um, I, I have I uh, can't recall what the uh, the uh, elevation was there with a grade on the roadway, but uh, it was fairly significant. Um, and you'll see when we look at the uh, some other deliverables here that I've created that the uh, the drone and the laser scanner do a pretty good pretty good job of showing the uh, the, uh, the the slope of that roadway. What I did um, this was of course a few years ago. I had, had gone to the scene again. Um, as recently as a few months ago with my Skydio drone, um, I, uh, I did a, a 2D mapping uh, flight over this scene. Um, I believe, uh, Noreen, you can probably help me with the report. Uh, there's there's the, uh, the point cloud that was created from those images. I believe it was a total of 56 images. And my elevation here was 125 feet above ground level at, at takeoff, which is over to the uh, right where that intersection is right there. That was my takeoff point. Um, the reason I used that elevation was I had a pretty significant uh, uh, grade there with some really, really high trees off on the sides of the roadway. Uh, literally, I would say they were a couple hundred feet um, high. So I wanted to uh, make sure that I avoided those um, at least where I was flying and not go too far out. The purpose of doing this this way was to show that, all right, so the police took 14 scans, which basically stopped where that double yellow line um, break is. And so I wanted to show the power of adding the drone data to the police scan data to expand um, the roadway to show a viewer um, how much, what the roadway looked like um, in both directions, a little further away from where the point of impact was. Um, so this was, of course, in a more uh, a really beautiful time of the year in New Hampshire where there was a bit of foliage. But um, so that's the reason there are, are colorful leaves out there. Um, so this is, again, from a point cloud created in the Ferrozone 3D Expert software using the photo points tool. And um, 56 photos, 125 feet in elevation. 
Are yeah, they? and I'll just add, add to that, Russ, because I have your report pulled up here. Um, those 56 photos only took four minutes of flight time. So about four minutes yeah. to capture what looks like 67,000 square feet of space that you captured there. I was explaining to the group here that the, the Skydio drone, and you, you mentioned what it does first when it's doing scanning, but it does, it, I call it a surveillance flight, if you will, to, to see what, what objects are in the area and what it needs to avoid. And then when it really does do its thing, it's quite, it's quite fast, unnerving fast in some, in some cases because it, it moves around very quickly, but um, does a great job. Um, this was a 2D uh, GPS scanning, so um, not really going down uh, low to the road or moving around objects, just taken from above. And my camera angle for this was at um, 60 degrees on an oblique, so not, not 90 degrees straight down to the surface, but um, 60 degrees uh, oblique angle to the surface. Yeah, and because I feel like we always get these questions too, your overlap was 80% and your side lap was 75%. Yes, and my, my go-to is a 75 or better. Um, obviously, the more, the more overlap, the, the more data, the better the data. But um, at some point, you have to uh, uh, sacrifice data for battery, battery time, um, you know, the number of photographs, processing time. But um, this, as you said, was only about a four-minute flight. And honestly, I do not recall uh, the processing time on this, but it was not very long. 56 photographs in the photo point software goes uh, rather quickly. Yep. All right, <clears throat> so now we can move on to your combined point cloud. So this is using the, the photo points tool um, and then combining the, the police data set with the drone data set. Um, a little hard to see where where those where that connection is made and i guess that's a good thing right so if it's difficult to see where the two emerge together not a great quality video but um where those are merged together is very difficult for you to see meaning that the data was really really tight the drone data was um the accuracy of that data was really great so that was no difficulty in aligning that with the scan data captured by the focus scanner um, the break in the asphalt there going from dark to light, by the way, is not from the two data sets. That was new asphalt versus old asphalt. So that's uh, the cause of that. Um, so what, it, what this allows you to do is go out to a scene at a later time, let's say with a drone, and then uh, fly over areas that you wish to add as part of your, your overall view or your presentation in the courtroom. And so you can take what, what would normally be, or in this case, a smaller data set by police with the laser scanner and add to that the drone uh, data and make for a larger, more, more complete presentation. Yeah, I think um, one of the biggest questions that I've had over the last couple of years is, if I have a laser scanner, why would I also be using drone? And I think the idea here is because the drone capture is so fast, you can capture the whole roadway, right, with a drone, and then you could just focus your laser scanner on the vehicles or the important evidence. Um, and same goes for, you know, I've worked plenty of shootings that have gone like blocks, right? A drone can capture that data really quickly, and then we can just focus on locations for potential trajectory with laser scanners. So it's a time saver. Um, you're not sacrificing a whole lot of accuracy there. You're getting out of the scene faster. Um, you're going to be able to process this back. And then you can always merge it. And it doesn't always have to be merging it with laser scanners, right? With Ferrozone software, because it's data agnostic, um, you can bring in total station data and align that with your drone image. You could bring in hand measurements and align that with a drone image. I mean, preferably you'd be moving away from hand measurements and you'd be using other technologies, but you can always just supplement whatever you're currently doing with the additional images, ortho mosaic or 3D point clouds from the drone as well. So um, this is the best part to me about Pharaoh Zone is, yeah, it's called Pharaoh Zone, but it's data agnostic. You can really just bring anything into it and create your courtroom deliverables. True, and the other thing that, that I find uh, one of the one of the, the benefits that I most like is the fact that I can get information from above that my scanner cannot see. So the the laser scanner is um, more or less a terrestrial uh, instrument that captures data from the ground. It does a, a fantastic job with that, but um, there are just times when it's not 
it's not practical to get that laser scanner in a place that's high enough to see things from above. And that's where the drone really shines. Um, so I, I, I preach the, you know, it's the benefit of having both tools in the toolbox, one for capturing things from high above, um, filling in say rooftops and areas that the drone, that the scanner cannot see and vice versa. You mentioned it earlier on in the presentation that the use of, of scanners, drones inside is not always practical. Um, and then that's where the laser scanner shines as far as doing uh, very, very um, high resolution measurements, uh, great accuracy inside smaller spaces. This is a, an overview, uh, actually not, an, well, it's an overview too, but it, this is an ortho mosaic um, diagram created from the, the uh, combination of both the police scan data and the drone data. Um, so both point clouds here are visible and merged into one. And this, of course, was done in the Ferrozone uh, 3D uh, expert software. Um, and then uh, from that, um, you showed earlier on, um, I was able to create a line drawing. Now, this line drawing is not as fancy as most line drawings that I do, but I, I just simply wanted to demonstrate how easy it is to just take that point cloud information, those 3D data points, and then using the Ferrozone software, connecting all of those data points and creating a scale, an accurate and scale diagram from, from the combination of the drone and scan data. And then I, I took it a, another step further here. And, and as I indicated, uh, you know, introduced a nighttime scene where I have my, my Nissan coming toward me, the truck losing control and the head, having a head on collision and then rotating out to final rest. And I, I didn't remove the vehicles at final rest on purpose, just so that you could see these cars, when they're when they're at final rest, they're actually moving down to the places where they were actually found. Another step, had I taken it to the next level in Ferrozone software, I could have um, damaged those vehicles to fit the scan damage that was captured by the police. Uh, in this case, it was just for the purpose of showing you that not only can we do emerging a point cloud data, but we can also animate this collision uh, and have these vehicles uh, demonstrate how these vehicles hit one another and then rotated to final rest, we can have them crushed. And in this case, we can even make it a nighttime scene where we've uh, made it darker, made the point cloud darker, and then added the use of headlights and taillights, or in this case, uh, no brake lights, but uh, brake lights are uh, another thing that we could have done with this, or street lights even, if there were some there. So that's one yeah. angle. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, Nori. Oh, no, sorry. I just wanted to know if you could speak to the heads up display up in the corner for those who aren't familiar with creating these animations in zone. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I, I like the heads up display. Um, in When you're creating an animation in the software, you can identify where the point of impact is. And then so, of course, point of impact is in the crash reconstruction world time zero. And everything goes back from the point of impact uh, in distance and in time. So what, what this is showing is this, by the way, is set up just to uh, demonstrate where the Nissan was. I could have turned, up, turned on a heads up display for both vehicles, but in um, this case, I wanted to show how far out was the, uh, the Nissan, how, lo how long was it to the time of impact and the distance traveled to the point of impact and the velocity of the vehicle at the time of impact. In this case, um, the velocity of the Nissan was 35 miles per hour. The truck was about 50 miles per hour, um, give or take. Um, that was based on a calculation that was also done in the software using an, uh, a head-on or inline uh, momentum calculation. But that was, of course, that's not part of this demonstration, but that was done in the Ferrozone software as well. Yeah, and I think you, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I think a key point here is that Zone has made it so easy to just do everything in zone. Um, one thing that was super frustrating to me being out in the field was that everything seemed to take so many pieces of software and you had to be relatively proficient in all of them. Um, and sometimes that could be overwhelming, especially if you weren't using some of them as frequently as others. And so Zone has made it really easy where once you bring in your data into Zone, whatever that is, right? That might be your laser scanner data, that might be just drone images, that might be drone point clouds, doesn't matter. Um, from there, you have all the tools that you need to go from that data to a simple line drawing, to an advanced reconstruction, to an animation, to a fly through video and so on and so on and so on. Um, and I think it's just excellent to have all your tools in one place 
So you don't have to find all these other pieces of software to kind of get you all the answers that you need for your case. Yeah, and there's another another wonderful tool, and of course it's beyond the scope of this this uh, workshop. But um, the new the new feature called Mass Zone, which is um, our our uh, computer uh, prediction simulation um, component of the software that allows us to not only you know animate how those vehicles come together, but to, but to with you know changing the parameters, see how that crash would unfold um, uh, in terms of its velocity, final rest positions, rotation, and so forth. So a really powerful new feature in the 2024 software. So if you have a, a moment, I would encourage you to, to uh, take a look at that. Excellent. Um, I think I wanna talk about real quickly, um, from a Skydio perspective, we will be doing a live demonstration of 3D scan. I know Russ touched on this briefly, um, but what makes 3D scan great and what makes um, Skydio easy to use is our advanced AI and autonomy. It's really, really hard, if not difficult, to just crash these drones, right? They're constantly building the environment around themselves. Um, and I've even seen Russ, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, just showing people like, watch, I will try to, to fly this right into this wall and it will stop. Because it's building the environment around itself, it, it knows where it is in space and it knows where, for example, your vehicles are, are, are in space. So when you're setting up your volume, your pillars to scan, whatever it is that you need in 3D, it's not gonna hit anything because it sees them. And it's building this environment internally for itself so that it does it automatically, autonomously, without you having to put much effort into it other than telling it what to do. So if you would like to see a demonstration of that, we have a warehouse um, out in California where we have set up some crashed vehicles. One of our solutions engineers We'll be live there with our drone to show the process of the 3D scan. So previously I showed you kind of a quick sped up video of what it looks like to set up your pillars, set up your volume, choose some other um, settings in there, and then have the, go the drone go do its thing. But you'll be able to get to see that live. In addition to that, we will provide you with all of the images captured by the drone. So you can go ahead and bring them into zone or whatever software you're using to see what that point cloud looks like, to see how long it takes to process and to see what you can do with it once you've created that point cloud. Um, so the QR code here is uh, for registration for that. That will be on February 2nd from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and uh, we will also send out an email. So if you see an email pen, uh, post to this webinar, it is for that live demonstration. But come hang out, see what it's all about. Um, you know, we've had some a lot of interest in flying directly in our, our warehouse and beyond crash reconstruction if you're interested in how um, remote operations work. You can always um, have a demonstration where we give you a link and you can fly the drone from wherever you are in the world, although the drone is located in a warehouse in California. So um, a couple of exciting things there to do. Um, and next we're going to go to some Q&A. Um, I've also included both of our email addresses here in case you need to reach out to us for anything. Um, one question, Russ, we'll just go to this one quickly because it's the last thing you talked about, but how much time do you have in creating those deliverables? Uh, not that long, really. The, the, the longest time is for the processing of the data uh, to create the point cloud from the images. And that, that depends largely on the number of photographs that are taken. Um, I would say on a, on a let's say, I'm, I'm throwing some numbers out. I'm really, I'm, I'm estimating let's say a hundred, a hundred photograph projects. So a project where the drone has captured a hundred photographs processing time. I think you would suggest you had said this about one earlier, maybe close to 30 minutes, uh, perhaps less. There are choices that you can make in the software on whether you want to choose a low resolution, medium or high resolution point cloud. Um, so, so of course the higher the resolution you choose, um, the longer that process would take. Um, but the process of merging, the two data sets um, is literally uh, long enough for you to click three points in one data set and similar or common three points in the second data set. And then they would they would then align. And lastly, you would simply just uh, um, create that merged uh, point cloud, which can again take upwards of, uh, I, I'm gonna say 10 or 15 minutes for the same 100 photo data set. And I, that's an estimate on the number. So please don't quote me on that, but somewhere in that area. 
Excellent. Um, yeah, and I think just in all the other deliverables, it's going to depend on how proficient you are with the software. Russ can do things a lot faster <laughs> than I can <laughs> because he's just more <laughs> proficient with it. <laughs> um, but I can do a shooting reconstruction in minutes, so there. Um, but I think it just depends on your proficiency in the software and you know, how familiar you are, not only with the tools that you're using, but the concepts and the science behind what you're trying to produce in there as well. So. And I, I'm looking forward to follow up on that. I'm looking forward to getting data from the new X10 because I, I know that the sensor on that that um, drone is like crazy over the top, fantastic. And I can imagine, and the reason I'm going there with this is that that the data is more, there's much more saturated data from those point clouds than there would be from say a, a drone that doesn't have a sensor quite as capable as that. And so there would be of course more data to process. And I'd be curious to see what that looks like. But um, as far as I'm concerned, more data, um, uh, especially uh, 3D scan data where it's filling in the sides of objects is, is, a, is a good thing um, and not not having sparse data. Sparse data doesn't look so great. Yeah, agreed. Um, in creating point clouds, where is the data stored, cloud or local? <clears throat> great. For us, it's all local. Um, for Ferro, FerroZone does not, we currently, for public safety anyway, we do not we do not store data uh, in the cloud. Um, all of your all of your processing, all of your workflow, everything occurs on your local, uh, either your laptop computer or your desktop, or you, if you have a networked uh, uh, system, then that would work as well. But none of it goes to the cloud. It's all locally based. So Skydio is whichever you choose. Um, we have Skydio Cloud where you can send all your data there. We also have a partnership with Axon, so you can send your data to evidence.com. Um, it just goes to Skydio Cloud and then straight over to your evidence.com account. Or you can just save it locally to the SD card, pop it out and do with it whatever you need to do. Put it in your own systems um, in-house or on-prem. Um, how are the deliverables transferred to prosecutors? Is that for you or me? <laughs> Either or. I mean, I think I think that there's a couple ways you can go about this, right? Um, if you're just talking about drone images, you're going to put those into evidence just as you would your scene photography. So those are going to get to your prosecutors in the same way. Um, hopefully not on a DVD drive anymore. Hopefully we're moving past that. Um, but if you're doing deliverables in the software, specifically FarrowZone, and I'll let Russ speak to this more, but you could use a zone to go. Yeah, so now there are a number of different ways. Um, so depending on the size of the final product, right? So um, size is certainly going to dictate what what sort of uh, device you would need to hold the capacity or the size of that that file. Zone to go, which is the the ferro zone version of our scene to go um, uh, component of the scene software, is is very very good. It doesn't it does not require the uh, the user or the viewer to have separate software it's all it's all run uh from a thumb drive um or an sd card or any other device that you're handing off an external drive let's say um so it, it can be exported just like any other file really uh, as long as that device is capable of holding uh, the large data set in some cases they can be very large but um storage is pretty inexpensive these days compared to what it used to be um, a one terabyte uh, SSD um, can be purchased for under $100, um, two terabyte for under $200. So uh, storage is no longer really much of an issue. Um, it is difficult, I will admit, to try to transfer this information uh, in the cloud uh, online because of the file sizes. Um, that's where the zone to go comes in. The file sizes are much more um, reasonable or manageable than, than, say, handing over the original data set. So original files versus copies of files, it can be a difference in, in that and the sizes of the files themselves. It would be exported, yeah. it, it would be exported in a, a various number of formats. If it's just the point cloud, it can be exported in FerroZone as an E57, a PTS, an LAS, um, or in FerroZone's uh, um, uh, format, a dot .fz proj file. Um, so, and those are fairly common ways of handing them over to other feral customers. Yeah, excellent. I think um, if if zone to go is a phrase that's uh, foreign to you and you were a zone user, you need to learn all about it. Um, 
I heard recently a couple agencies say, we have all this great data, we have no way to get it to our prosecutors. And you you absolutely can do that um, with zone to go and you can package it all up in a nice little thumb drive for them and pass it on and they can use it without needing software and without needing licensing. So um, make sure you familiarize yourself with that if you are not aware. Um, the next question here, and I hopefully I'm interpreting this right, um, will it capture data at night? Um, I will speak to this briefly and then Russ, if you've got something to add on there. Um, so currently the X10 specifically is um, at first customer ship, we were shipping it with one sensor package. However, the X10 has what we're calling an upgradable sensor package. So we will create more of those during the lifetime of the X10. And shortly to come out in the new year is a new sensor that is going to be best for mapping. And it also includes a, um, an, an embedded LED flashlight on the sensor. And so we're doing some testing right now to see if because X10 or because Skydio drones can fly so close to the subject without crashing, is that light enough to provide the light that you need to capture this data at night? So that's kind of still under testing. I'm not gonna say yes or no yet. However, a lot of our agencies that are using drones are just bringing out some lights to illuminate the area that they need and then they're still flying their drones for data capture. So you can, you just have to be a little bit more creative because you have to remember it is a camera. Um, and so likewise with any other photography, low light conditions are just difficult. And you beat me to it, <clears throat> Noreen. I, I, my simplest answer for that is it is a camera. At the end of the day, that's, you know, so ask yourself that question. If you, if you took a photograph from the height of where the drone happens to be, will that image, will, will you be able to see things? Is there enough available light or do you need to introduce artificial light into that scene to capture that image? I have scanned at nighttime uh, in the past in an area where there's a lot of street light or a lot of ambient light from uh, businesses, say, along the side of a busy road. Uh, that is doable. But of course, also with cameras, you have to take speed into consideration. The shutter speed would need to be, uh, I mean, it would need to be open longer. Therefore, your movement would have to be almost no movement at all. Or if there is any movement, very, very slow movement. So in nighttime photography cases, you would have to um, have your drone stop, take a picture, move, stop, take a picture, move, and so on in order to capture really great images with low light. Yeah, and that actually kind of ties into another question that was on here about um, does the shutter affect motion blur? And um, you can always, and, and 3D Scan has this ability too, to stop at structure. So it will intentionally stop to capture that image before it moves on. Um, it's like, you know, a little bit longer, but you're going to get the best data possible. Mm -hmm. Um, a question here for you, Russ. What aerial perspectives do you think work best for crash data? Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, I, I typically, my, my go-to perspective, I go to, I, I try to, of course, always be above the highest object in my, in my area that I'm trying to fly with in. And, um, and generally speaking, um, I'm even in New England where I have a lot of mountains and trees. I, if I, I try to take the highest uh, point for launch, since that's the measurement from my above ground level where my, my drone will go, I generally can go up to about 125 to 150 feet above the ground. Um, my camera setting is, um, as I said earlier, Ferrozone, maybe I didn't say it earlier in this workshop, maybe it was in a class I was teaching, but, but the, uh, the Ferrozone software requires um, an oblique angle uh, setting for the camera. Uh, it cannot uh, do a, uh, a neutral directional. Uh, in other words, it cannot use a 90 degree uh, uh, images to the surface. Those do not work well with the software. So that camera angle I recommend is a 60 degree oblique. Um, and really anything greater than zero will work, but 60 degrees seems to be a sweet spot, at least uh, from my experience. Um, I set my overlapping uh, data, uh, my overlapping images at either 75 or 80% um, as, as a, a, a baseline, if you will, and sometimes even more than that, but 75 to 80 is, is typically my go-to. Hopefully that answers that question. Excellent. Yeah. And for reference in the uh, drone data that he showed in that case study, uh, your, your gimbal angle was 60 degrees for that. 
And I usually use a cross grid pattern. I don't believe that I flew, a, I might've thrown a, flew a cross grid pattern there. Um, basically I send the drone down on a lawnmower pattern back and forth and the cross grid is then reversing or, or rotating that, that flight 90 degrees to the original path and then doing another series of flight, another flight, if you will, over the same area, but from a 90 degree angle. Um, and that gives me the best data, especially with the oblique, the drone is capturing data, looking at all areas of the objects below uh, from different angles, as opposed to just down and back. Uh, so I find that uh, produces a much nicer point cloud. Excellent. Um, the question here is, should one mark pillars near open doors of a vehicle for best results? Um, so basically for for 3D scan, you can put your pillars anywhere so long as everything you need is inside the pillars. Um, if you had, I mean, we have indoor capture for 3D scans. So you could set an entire, you know, pl uh, building or a warehouse for capture. Um, as long as your pillars just encompass everything you absolutely need, you will have the results that you need for the 3D scan and the um, subsequent point cloud. Um, Russ, how often are you flying manually? <clears throat> oh, we were just talking about that today. Um, <laughs> my go, my go-to is autonomous. I usually do a, I have a, I use a mapping application, uh, when I'm using the Skydio, of course, I'm using the enterprise application and that pretty much uh, handles everything for me. I tell it how high I want it to fly and what my camera angle is going to be and, and set my, my, uh, my parameter on, on the, uh, the map that's provided and I hit go. Um, but there are times when I'm looking for information along the sides of objects, such as vehicles at a, at a collision where I wanna fly around that, or I wanna capture the sides of buildings and I wanna be able to get the facades of buildings uh, more clearly and get more data points for that area. Maybe I wanna model it. Um, in that case, I would, I would typically do a separate flight where I'm flying low and, in, and with the with the Skydio drone, it's easy because I can do a 3D scan from that. And as you said, set the parameters of what that scan needs to be. And I know that the drone is going to take whatever number of images it needs to capture that object. Um, larger, of course, takes more time, more photos. Um, if I wasn't using a Skydio drone or if I was flying manually, even with the Skydio drone, I would drop the height, of course, my altitude down and take a series of photographs along those those faces of objects that I wanted to be, be sure I had uh, data for. So it just depends, but um, I'd say percentage wise, not very often. Um, with, this, with the oblique on the camera, I'm capturing pretty much what I need, at least at a crash scene. Um, if, I if I wanted to do a model of a car and then 3D print that car, it would probably, I'd probably take, uh, I'd do a 3D scan and have that, the Skydio drone at a much lower and closer observation point uh, than, than high above. Excellent. And then just to add to that with 3D scan, um, once it goes around and it does its thing and it comes back, you can view that on the controller. And if you see that you would like some more data in a certain area, you can go back around and take additional manual photographs. And those will just all go into the same flight project essentially. So you'll just have additional photos in the areas that were more important to you. Let's say, let's say you, set up um, your 3D scan around two vehicles, but you wanted more data in an area of crush damage, you could manually take those images after the 3D scan flight just to supplement what it had captured. I just want to put in a plug for the for the meshing uh, component of your, of your drone. It's something that you don't see. Um, in fact, I don't know of any other uh, manufacturer that's doing that. Uh, maybe they are, but I'm not aware of that. And that's a whole nother process beyond the creation of the point cloud and beyond the, the combination of the point clouds to, to create a, me, a textured mesh of an object. Um, I use that uh, procedure all the time. Um, so to see that your software does that or your, your, uh, your solution does that is, is a good thing for me. Yeah, we're really excited about the onboard model. So excited to see what people do with it. Um, we have two more questions on here. We have a few more minutes. So if you have anything else, go ahead and throw it in the chat there. Um, but Russ, can you just quickly talk about Faro handheld scanners? Um, I'm sure they're talking about the Freestyle 2, and I don't know specifically for what, but maybe we'll just talk about it in the situation of crash. By the way, um, 
Noreen is a freestyle two expert <laughs> or was, <laughs> um, but you do now work for Skydio. But um, so the freestyle two hand scanner, an amazing device. It's um, come a long way uh, since I started with Ferro seven years ago, almost eight years ago. Um, it is a portable device that that can be uh, that can be moved around objects, um, uh, large objects or larger objects such as vehicles um, in small rooms can be scanned in a matter of a minute or two or three. Whereas if those objects were scanned using the the uh, laser scanner, that might might take a bit more time than that. Um, at the end of that, uh, the capture um, it's using a process of lidar photogrammetry to create a three dimensional point cloud. That data can then be um, uh, merged easily with um, scan data captured by the uh, Ferro Focus scanners, our premium scanner. So um, create some really nice uh, colored uh, point clouds for um, bodies. Let's say again, I want to emphasize smaller spaces, um, uh, small rooms, small offices uh, around cars, around bodies, and, and that can then be easily merged in with with uh, scan data captured by our premium scanner. Um, not something that works uh, well um, in direct sunlight. Um, so it's, it does have a limitation where it can't be used in direct sunlight outside um, in bright on bright sunny days. It does a fairly good job in, in uh, scanning objects that are covered or where, where direct sunlight is blocked from, from reaching the object. The accuracy Excellent. is, is as, as good as the laser scanner is. Yeah, hopefully that answered the question there. Um, and again, that's another thing that, you know, you could even use a drone for the majority of your scene and then the focus for the vehicle, or sorry, the freestyle two for the vehicles. It's the same process to merge those point clouds in zone as it would be for the focus. <clears throat> um, okay, next question. Um, and this is specific to zone software. They said their agency has zone 3D advanced and they were told that would work for importing drone photographs, but they're having issues. Um, just a quick call out on here, you need Ferrozone 3D Expert. Mm -hmm. So it's um, likely that you just don't have the most updated version of the software. It was the, let me not get my years. Two years ago, up. I think. Two years roughly, does that sound right? Last year, so the 2023 version, um, about this time last year, uh, of Ferrozone 3D Advanced became 3D Expert, and that's what allowed for photo points, which is the photogrammetry feature. So you're just going to have to confirm if you have um, the ability to get Expert, and then you will have um, the ability to use photo points. And if you do have the, the a version that does do that, what I'm seeing at least a couple of times recently where customers believe that you simply just import the the images and that creates a point cloud well there's a process that that needs to be worked through there's a workflow that needs to uh, get you from images to a point cloud and um, it's not difficult but it's just a process and you need to know what that process is excellent um, and then it looks like we have one more question and then we can wrap up so the question is how large can the area be for the 3d scan function and I don't know that I have a specific number for you. Um, however, with 3D Scan, we created indoor capture, which was intended to be used in warehouses or factories, like really large indoor environments. Um, and really what you're restricted by there is just the battery flight time, like how, how often you're just going to have to switch the batteries throughout that process. Um, but I don't know that I have a specific, like, it won't capture beyond this, because um, I don't know that anyone's said yet, hey, I tried to scan this this large of an area and it just didn't work. Um, again, larger areas, more images, lots more data. Um, so you're talking about really, really big data sets at the end of that. <clears throat> All right, Russ, well, we've come to the end of our session. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate it. I've missed hanging out with you, especially in webinars. Yeah, um, we really ask you all the time, Noreen, so you have to, we have to do this more. <laughs> yeah, we will. Um, to everyone that's hanging out with us today, really appreciate it. Hopefully you kind of took away some nuggets of knowledge along the way, whether it's about drone use or the use of uh, Verizon software to use all of this technology to create your courtroom deliverables. 
Um, we just put up on the Skydio end, we just put up a crash and crime scene documentation page on our website where you can get some more information there and hopefully some more cool projects to follow as we start to do some more work here with our new X10. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us. You know where to find us. Otherwise, thank you. We really appreciate you hanging out and